in the beginning, as we read those stories from 1 Samuel, folks weren't used to it, sort of wondered what was up. And so at a certain point, I asked the session, well, do you want to stop now? And they said, no, 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 we don't want you to stop now. <laughs> we might like a little context for the reading that we hear on any given Sunday, just so we're caught up on the plot, but we'll continue with it. I'm glad that's working out. Would you pray with me? Spirit of God, we ask that your word will come alive for us today, that we might even be able to glimpse a new kind of life because of what we hear from you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The text says that, uh, I mean, the bulletin says that the text is uh, Luke 11, 1 to 23. It's actually going to be Luke 11, 1 to 3, I think. Uh, but that wasn't Alex's fault. That was mine. <laughs> Want to give her a break. Uh, this is the Lord's Prayer. Okay, but it's the Lord's Prayer in Luke, which sounds kind of different from the one in Matthew. And uh, so I think you'll, you'll obviously recognize it, but it's kind of punchier, shorter. And it begins with the disciples coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. Now, when, when these teachers taught you to pray, they weren't saying, okay, repeat this over and over. Not that it's a bad thing to repeat it over and over. They're trying to give a model trying to help their disciples understand what a life of prayer would be about. And so this is an outline of something bigger than just a prayer, we would say over and over, though saying it over and over does allow us to have that sense of, of the completeness of what a prayer life might be. So Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught us. So he said to them, when you pray, say this, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. Mm -hmm. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. So yesterday, a giant in the faith, a giant of prayer, died after a long life. His name was Bill Brownson. He was a remarkably faithful man. I won't be able to go to his memorial service, so this will be be partly eulogy and partly sermon, because Bill taught me an awful lot about prayer. He was a remarkable man. He uh, was the radio preacher for Words of Hope for the Foreign Church of America. At one point, his sermons every week were translated into 96 languages. He had a powerful voice and a deep faith. I grew up at Penile, seeing him every year, learning from him. I knew his kids pretty well. I'm not sure that I'd be a pastor without Bill, because there was one critical moment in my development as a pastor in, in school when I was pretty discouraged. And Bill sat with me and made it clear that, that faithfulness to God's call required going through some of those discouraging times. I'm grateful to Bill. He had a profound connection. You could feel it to the presence of God. But I went through a long period where I just couldn't understand it. I couldn't get this, what seemed like blind faith to a God that I couldn't really trust to answer prayer. Now, I've talked to you about this before. And, and the reason I bring it up again is statistically, I know that more than, half, more than half of the people sitting here right now struggle with the kinds of doubts that I had when I was younger. I told you about my friend Timmy, who I grew up with at Panayo, who, who died after three days in a coma, even though everybody was praying for him. It, it, 
it felt at the time like God was arbitrary, answering some people's prayers, not answering other people's prayers. And if you have those kinds of doubts and they penetrate you and what's going on, what happens is your prayer life stagnates. Bill understood that. So my prayer life had stagnated. But as Dylan would say, I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now, which means I have a kind of open imagination, kind of a belief that's willing to take some risks and see where it goes. So, you know, I, I've been able to grasp hold of some of what Bill was about and what Bill had taught me. How did he deal with what was real though? That was the question. How does he deal with the fact that some prayers don't seem to be answered by God? He didn't exactly have an easy life, my friend Bill. I mean, he watched Timmy grow up just as he watched me grow up year after year. He was disappointed too when Timmy died. His oldest son, Billy, was born developmentally, developmentally disabled, seriously so. He, he died by the time he was six. And the next oldest, Dave, who was, who was my age, uh, he developed some serious psychiatric problems, partly because his older brother had died, and, and he ended up committing suicide. Bill did not have an easy life, and yet this deep and profound connection to the presence of God. No blaming God, nothing like that. Well, I know what he'd say as to why it was that he was able to do that, so I think I'll share it with you. Partly because he taught me and partly because he wrote about it. And it would center on the first two petitions of the Lord's Prayer in Luke. Father, hallowed be thy name and your kingdom come. Those two. The first one, Father, hallowed be your name. The name that Jesus had in mind is I am. The one he told Moses, tell him I am that I am sent you. That, that being, that one that can't be escaped for it encompasses all things. Now, Bill and I would disagree a bit on the language we would use to talk about that being. Bill's a theist for those of you who are in the Wednesday night class and, and thinks there's a God outside or thought there's a God outside uh, operating and acting upon creation, where I look at it a little differently. I, I think creation emerges from the being of God and God interpenetrates all of creation, but it really in the end doesn't matter because we both agree on the character of that God. Father, Father, hallow it. Now, that can be problematic in modern preaching now to call God Father, because sometimes your view of Father is a little distorted, because some fathers are frankly really awful, and none of us are perfect. But, but for Bill, he talked about the Father in an idealized way, a Father who consistently and forever and always was seeking to have you thrive. Isn't that great? to have everything in your life thrive. When you fall short and you're not thriving, that father welcomes you home and tries to help guide and direct you in a new way. Always about growing with you and embracing you. Can you imagine living in that presence so much that just at the root of who you are in your being, you know that you could fall forever and never escape the loving arms of God. That was Bill. He could do that. He knew that the presence of the creative power of God loved us so much that we couldn't escape it and would never want to. But he'd say there's more to it to be able to deal with what's real. And that's the second petition. Your kingdom come. Now again, Bill and I might disagree in how we would talk about that. 
Bill would say something like, God is acting on creation and has created and planned the whole thing so that God can see the whole perfection of creation before him. It's not quite how I look at it. I, I think that the creation is emerging from the being and it's becoming, it's evolving until it moves to perfection. But either way, both Bill and I would look and say that the purpose of our lives is to focus on God's project of creation. But that's what gives our life meaning and purpose that we are here to be a part of God's perfecting work. That's what it's all about. And so when Bill prays, and when I try to pray this way, he's all about praying for God's creative work in the world and not for his own needs. Isn't that interesting? God's work comes first. And with that focus on God's work, there's no sense of demand or a sense that God should help him avoid all the trials and tribulations of living in an imperfect world. He could sense the presence. He knew the presence could not escape God's love. And the focus allowed him not to hang on to everything in his life so that when he lost, it would be ruined. I've known three people with faith like that. My Grammy, my mother, and Bill. And so it is that Bill was formed by that life of prayer that Jesus laid out here. And it allowed him to be younger than that now too. It allowed him to be flexible and to change. Bill was a pretty strong evangelical. And so when the great, you know, schism in our church of the last few decades happened, you know what I'm talking about when we argued forever about whether or not it was appropriate to be homosexual or not, whether that was a sin or not. When that all began, he had strong opinions. But it turned out that his grandson was gay. And so he prayed and he agonized. He wrote about it until finally he began to hear from the presence of God that he'd known his whole life, that he needed to bless that marriage. He performed the marriage ceremony for his grandson and the grandson's partner and blessed that. That's what it's like when you commit yourself to God's work. You're able to shift and change as God leads you. Now we can argue whether or not he was right or wrong. That's not quite my point. My point is that his relationship to the divine allowed him not to be afraid, but to instead focus on where he thinks God is moving. Bill sought God's will. Jesus outlined this life of prayer that we're all supposed to live, and Bill exemplified it. He knew that life was sourced by the love of God, and he recognized that God's will was more important than ours, that God's project was what the purpose of our life is about. And those two things allowed him to ride the waves of what sometimes was a very painful life. I'm telling you about, Bill, because that's an opportunity for you, too. But it, it takes consistent work. You don't one day just say, oh, I'm going to live a life like that. It requires discipline. It requires thought. Sometimes you research it. Sometimes you journal about it. But you stay with it. And you begin to sense the source of that love welling up within you. And as it forms you and you focus on that, you find that you can't escape the loving arms of God. 
And your life becomes way more important when you are playing an important role in the growth and development of God's creation. Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive ourselves, as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. A pattern of prayer Bill would recommend it to you. 